the Carolinas. It's usually fun coming down here. I tell you what, though, every now and again, I'm not too fond of driving through the mountains, but it depends on how heavy I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going. But in this case, headed home, sort of. Sweet home, Chicago, as it were. Yeah, headed home so I can actually do my Christmas shopping. Not knock off my phone while I'm trying to record video. And, well, all that, as it were, as well. So, fuel for the road. Had a bit of a snack to snack because why not? Ready to rock and roll through this portion of well, this motorhome or uh, this guy go first because he's already moving. Let's see. Oh, we got someone else coming behind him. All right, let's see what's what. Oh, he's pulling in. Good deal. All right, off to the races we go. Anyway. What I'm fixing to ramble about here for a few minutes while I get rolling is how easy it is for us as Americans, especially younger Americans like myself and the folks who have come after me, you know, the so called Zoomers and whoever else, whatever other names are floating around out there. It is so easy for us all to forget just how beautiful our nation is and one of the most appreciated elements for me when I'm down in the Carolinas, Eastern Tennessee, uh, Central Virginia, West Virginia, um, you know, parts of Texas. Northern Minnesota, Central New York State even, um, is just how staggeringly gorgeous of a nation we really do have. I mean, we've got national forests left, right, and center. We've got all these wonderful places to go and things to see, and yet, instead of, you know, nationally treasuring all that we have available to us, you know, we're hopping on planes to go to Italy, go to Switzerland, go to Spain, go to Germany, go to England, go to France to see what they have, which to a certain degree I can definitely appreciate that and I have no hate for the Europeans because they do have a scenery that does have significant history associated with it, whereas by comparison, American scenery is a heck of a lot younger in terms of how long it's been documented and also does not have nearly the same level of history as uh, the European scenery does because our mountains don't have the pathways that were used by Alexander the Great or the Roman legions. Our plains don't have forts and castles and walls on them that were used um, to fortify ancient Rome or keep out the barbarian hordes or that became the launch pads for the great conquests of ancient Europe or that demarcated who owned what, which lords owned which tracts of land which, you know, castles dominated which areas and who had what serfs and whatever else. So the absence of that history makes our scenery, in a manner of speaking, significantly less interesting than the scenery in Europe and also to a certain extent uh, Asia as well. So it's just, you know, it's an unavoidable element of global history, that America being so much younger in terms of its civilized nature and its 
documented uh, history doesn't have the appeal that the old world of Europe has. It just doesn't. It's just, that's just simply the way it is. And of course, uh, you come down to North Carolina, where I'm at right now, and everyone, for the most part, 90% of all residents in this area, I would be very surprised if it was less than 90%, they all speak English. Fluently. Con conversationally. No problem. Whereas... You move from England to France, now French is the dominant language. You go from France to Germany, now German is the dominant language. And you have two dialects of German. You've got Hochdeutsch, and I believe uh, Southern Germany, I think Süddeutsch is an actual dialect unto itself, or Bavarian German is its own dialect. So you have this entirely different cultural dynamic to crossing a border in Europe versus crossing a border in the United States. In the United States, English is still a dominant lingua franca. Yeah, Spanish is a very close number two, but at the same time, you know, English is still the dominant language, at least for the time being. How long that remains the case is anyone's guess. Some folks say it's not too much longer where Spanish becomes a dominant language, but you know, I guess we'll see what actually happens when everything plays out. But, uh, yeah, there's just, there's not that same, ooh, I'm in a whole different country. No, I'm in North Carolina. Came down from Virginia. <laughs> That's kind of the way uh, I approach it because, I mean, the scenery we have here in the States, in Appalachia, the Rocky Mountains, uh, Sierra Nevada is out in California. I mean, some of the scenery we have, in my opinion, easily rivals what you can see anywhere in Europe in a lot of degrees, just in terms of how naturally beautiful it is. And, uh, you know, how you get through it and so forth. Ah, another factor. Because the United States grew up in a time where you, humanity as a whole was rocketing towards a more modern way of doing things, uh, we have easier ways to get through our mountains. We were able to blast and tunnel and all of that through mountains and create far easier pathways for travel, whereas in Europe, especially in Italy, you know, you've, you've got the old Roman roads, and they were switchback roads up and down the mountains, because that's the best they could do, you know, 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, that was it, that was all they had, that was the epitome, that was the crest, that was the peak of their ability at that time to dominate and shape the landscape in terms of making roads. Now, they are great roads if you're not a semi-truck driver. If you're a truck driver, God save you, because those roads will probably drive you insane, get you started, get you killed, depending on what's going on. And of course, you know, in modern times, you know, obviously, Europe has put in, you know, far more improved roadways and bridges and tunnels. So they have a road network that is at least as good as the U.S. network for the most part, but depending on who you talk to, some will say that the U.S. roads are better, others will say European roads are better, and there's really no consensus, it's just a matter of opinion. But anyway, we were able to blast through our mountains, Europeans, the Romans more accurately, not so much. But anyway, I'm digressing here. So we have the same caliber in many respects of natural beauty as the Europeans do. But we don't have the cultural divides that border crossings have in Europe, which is fine. I mean, people can still say, well, people still do say that uh, when you cross over the Mason-Dixon line, you definitely enter the South and it's a bit of a different world. And yeah, that's, that is true to a certain extent. That is very true. 
but it's not as true as you would think because it's still Americans. These are still our fellow people. You know, we might be residents of particular states, but we're all citizens of the same nation. So that is the great unifying, in theory, great unifying factor that underpins everything, whereas even though the European Union can claim, you know, it has 500 million people as its citizens, the cultural divides between the member states of the European Union are still staggeringly deep and strong. They're even more entrenched than what we have here in the States. I mean, half the reason that Brexit happened in the first place as far as I understand it, is that England was getting tired of being told what to do by Brussels. However, what they didn't realize is that they probably could have approached things a little more diplomatically. Of course, the other part of that fact, the other factor of that was uh, the, uh, the migrant crisis that Europe experienced um, as ISIS was rampaging through the Middle East and just raping and murdering and committing atrocities left, right, and center, uh, you had these huge swat, these huge groups of migrants moving up into Central Europe, into Germany, into Turkey, uh, Italy, you know, and they were coming to England, and England was like, no, we do not want these migrants coming in here. So they were like, okay, you're not going to stop the flow and let us preserve the sanctity of our borders and our, our nation. We're not going to be part of your program anymore. We're going we're gonna to leave. And so they did. Now, the diplomatic and the economic fallout of that is still unfurling. And it's probably going to be a few years before the whole thing gets uh, sorted out in any real capacity. But, you know, the politics of cultural division that still remain in Europe have informed, you know, national policy for a number of nations. So, that's where we're at, I guess you could say. Whereas in the States, yeah, people would love to see California fall off a cliff, depending on the day. Uh, some Californians would love to see California be able to secede from the Union. And there's still a bunch of folks in Texas who was like, yeah, we can do just fine on our, on our own. Let's go ahead and just kick off from the states and be our own nation. The Republic of Texas born again. Well, that didn't work out so well uh, when Texas had that deep freeze and knocked out their whole power network. So, pros and cons to everything. Pros and cons to everything. Now, of course, we do still have the cultural divisions between states in the U.S., but again, they're nowhere near as stark or, or divisive as they are in Europe. It's, that's just the nature of the two beasts. Europe and the European Union are a collection of nations that have been firmly entrenched in their borders for centuries. Whereas, by comparison to states, I mean... We only stopped adding the 48 states to the Union, I believe, in 1912, when I think it was Arizona, maybe, maybe it was Arizona, was it Arizona? Anyway, there were a handful of states that joined the Union before World War I. I want to say Arizona was one of them, New Mexico might have been another one. They were territories and then became states during the 20th century. And that wasn't the contiguous 48 states. That wasn't Alaska and Hawaii in 1959. That was the contiguous 48 that were still being added in the 20th century. So our borders are new, like squeaky, squeaky shiny, brand new by comparison to Europe's borders. What does that have to do with the scenery? <laughs> of the United States. It's like, well, it ties back in with the history of the scenery. Like this, I'm driving through um, the Great Smoky Mountains right now. The Great Smoky Mountains any time of the year are beautiful. Now, granted, in the summertime, they are more beautiful, or when there's snow down there, more beautiful. Right now, it's just, you know, dormant, hibernating forest with pine trees floating around for some color, but...
still a staggeringly beautiful scenery that I'm driving through that I would not get to experience if I was driving a desk instead of driving a truck. So I am tremendously thankful for what my rolling office provides me in terms of the ability for my view to change on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour basis. See here now I'm about to hit Tennessee, the patron state of shooting stuff, as Mark Wahlberg said in that movie, Shooter, which, you know, good movie, kind of cheesy, but, you know, it is what it is. Anyway, so Tennessee, here we are. Still beautiful mountains, still lovely scenery. And there's some fine people down here, too. There really are some good folks in Tennessee. There's good folks in all 50 states. I don't care who you are, what you are, what your political or ideological bend is. There's good people all over the place. And you find them sometimes by accident. Other times they're just right out there in front of you. Other times you gotta look. It's the way of the world. But still. It's important for us not to forget how fortunate we Americans are, how good we really do have it, and the opportunities that are out there for everyone, and anyone, if you're willing to work for it. I mean, I was willing to work for this truck, and I got the truck. I was willing to put you know, other things, other goals, other dreams on hold to get this business of mine off the ground. Things are going well. Which means that for me, the other dreams of my life that I have are dreams delayed or, more accurately, dreams financed. (laughs) So, the hard work that I'm putting in all the miles, literally the 200,000 plus miles I've driven over the last two plus years as a company driver and an owner operator. Uh, they're all, every single mile is paying off. Every single mile is bringing me closer to dreams fulfilled, life goals achieved. And I really can't complain. And being able to do that, to, to put myself on course, to realize my dreams enables me also to see some of the most beautiful parts of the nation at the same time. And if you live in these areas, uh, you take them for granted because you're just used to it. It's just, it's, it's home. You know home. You understand home. But for someone like me who is literally just visiting, just passing through as it were, it's a whole different uh, level of appreciation that makes me want to stop, get out, take a few deep breaths, put on a lawn chair and relax a little bit, but miles mean money, gotta keep working. Anyway folks, if I was to give any sage advice, I would say take a moment, stop and appreciate where you're at, when you're at, and where you're at, and what you're about. just because that moment won't come again. Pardon me. And that one moment you might gain an appreciation for what's around you that you previously did not have. I appreciate this view every time I come through it because it just is so beautiful. I mean, some of these mountains are absolutely awe-inspiring. I haven't been out west in, you know, over two years. I want to get back out west. I want to go through the Rockies again. I want to go through states like Colorado and Wyoming and Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, California, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Utah. I want to go to those places again, but the Great Smokies are just as nice. 